no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Don't forget to stay connected, tell us what you like, and help support us on Patreon if you can. Despite a decisive victory a few decades before, the United States was worried. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States could have ruled the world. But only five years after that terrible destruction, the Soviet Union had stolen the secrets to the atomic bomb and detonated one of their own on the plains of Kazakhstan, and then gone on to develop a rocket system better than anything we had, capable of putting satellites into orbit or dropping a multi-ton nuclear warhead on Washington just 28 minutes after the order was given. And as if that wasn't enough, the Soviets had set their sights on the moon. These weren't just rumors. The Soviets had started landing probes and rovers on the moon in preparation for a radiation-shielded base shown here. They would accomplish this feat with the massive N-1 rocket system. Powered by 30 NK-15 rocket engines, it was more powerful than anything America had. In fact, until the launch of the SpaceX Starship, the N-1 rocket was the most powerful to lift off from the Earth. American scientists and military leaders knew that whoever controlled the moon would control orbital space. Getting mass to the moon became a matter of national survival. The United States Air Force wasn't quite 20 years old as an independent service, but it had been tasked with securing the moon for America and establishing the strategic high ground by building a military base ahead of the Soviets. Before some of you argue that this would violate the Outer Space Treaty, that document didn't exist yet. Historically to this point, whoever got somewhere first with the biggest guns had been able to claim it for themselves. Even if someone else was living there, if those people did not have the military power to throw out the newcomers. This precedent meant the United States would need a rapid response plan to get to the moon first with enough firepower to hold on to it. The classified plan to accomplish this was called LUNEX. LUNEX would start with a large three-stage rocket system to launch a manned spacecraft on a direct lunar intercept. The manned system would be an advanced space plane capable of landing three humans on the lunar surface and able to launch and come back to Earth surviving the 11.2 kilometers per second or 37,000 feet per second re-entry speed. Automated systems would land large habitats and equipment to build the Project Horizon military base. Project Horizon would have used heavy equipment to bury the habitats under the regolith for radiation shielding, creating a permanent human presence on the moon. This lunar base would need to be within plus or minus 20 degrees latitude from the moon's equator. Three sites were selected as options. The Eratosthenes Crater, Sinus Medea, and Montes Apenninus. At these locations would be installed 6.1 by 3 meter cylinders, 20 by 10 feet, that would be linked and buried as shown here. Then two nuclear reactors would be located in pits dug out for this purpose. Why not use solar? For one thing, this is a military base. You don't want your infrastructure to be vulnerable to anyone with a rock and a good throwing arm. The moon also, here at the equator, has constant sunlight for half a month, then darkness for the other half. Nuclear was the smartest way to go. Empty storage tanks and containers could all be repurposed for supply and weapons storage. There would also be two types of vehicles, one for personnel transport, reconnaissance and rescue, the other for heavy lifting, dragging, and digging. The base would be defended by low-yield nuclear warheads. At about two kilotons, these were the smallest in the United States arsenal, and would be launched on Davy Crockett rockets. The base would also be secured with Claymore mines. I am familiar with Claymore mines. We use them in the Marines. These are like giant shotgun shells, 
launching 712 caliber or 3.2 millimeter metal balls at 3,996 feet per second. This is 1,218 meters per second and about Mach 3 if we had any air around, and would do a real number on any approaching ship or pressure suited enemy soldier. To accomplish all this, would require about 40 heavy lift launches at the start. This may sound like a lot, but remember, the current SpaceX plan is to carry out up to 20 Starship launches for every one trip to the Moon or Mars. Lunex was planned to start with cargo in January of 1965, then landing two men by April. Those two would get everything ready for another 12 that would be landed by November. These men would land three at a time in this. This is the Lunex Lunar Lander and Reentry Vehicle. After accomplishing their mission, they could use this landing stage base to return to Earth. Getting back to Earth from the Moon takes a lot less propellant, about 8% as much Delta V, as getting to the Moon in the first place. That's because the gravity hill we must climb is a lot smaller. To create the Lunex spaceship, the U.S. Air Force started developing advanced hydrogen-fueled rocket engines. These included the RL-10, an expander cycle engine capable of throttling to only 15% power, still flying today on the SLS and Vulcan rockets, and still, over a half century later, the most efficient rocket engines ever made. For the Lunex program, they also started building the J-2 rocket engine, also hydrogen-fueled. This should all start becoming familiar to most of you. I will say it again. Almost all of the great rocket science concepts were imagined by Soviet, American, and yes, German space scientists in the 1950s to 70s. Everything we do today is based on the genius of those engineers. There would also be a lunar landing stage for decelerating and landing cargo. It had to be able to take 134,000 pounds from a velocity of 9,000 feet per second to a 20 foot per second landing. That should make all my Imperial friends happy. With another 60 rocket launches, transporting 220 tons to the base, and another 120 tons to follow later. The rocket required was designed for rapid deployment, and it involved one of the largest solid rocket motors to ever be built and tested. This is the AJ-260 SL-3. It is 24.6 meters or 82 feet long and 6.6 .6 meters or 22 feet wide. It produced 26.2 meganewtons, or 5.6 million pounds of thrust. The AJ-260 was to be the booster for a central core that used hydrogen and oxygen propellant. The core stage was designed to produce 6 million pounds of thrust. The second and third stages would also use hydrolox engines. If all of this is familiar, it should be. Kennedy decided to go with a civilian moon mission instead of a military one. But all this work was not wasted. The Apollo Saturn V used the J-2 engines in its second and third stages. The main contribution from Von Braun's army team was the RP-1-fueled F-1-powered first stage. But all of this planning didn't go to waste, as you will recognize it now in the SLS. It is almost exactly what the Air Force had planned for Horizon. The much more efficient Lunex lander and re-entry vehicle, however, was redesigned to be the massive, low-Earth-only capable space shuttle, combining cargo and human transport. A fatal flaw, in my opinion, though I do not deny that the U.S. space shuttle was an incredible feat of engineering. It would have been much simpler to go with the original concept, keeping passengers and mass payloads separate. Had the Challenger disaster occurred with the earlier design, with the ship here, an abort would have been possible even with the external tank exploding. In fact, the crew of the Challenger survived the explosion and were killed on impact with the ocean. The Lunex vehicle, here on top of the rocket system, instead of strapped to the side of it, could have almost certainly saved the crew. If there is one thing the military is very dedicated to, it's the protection of their pilots. The Challenger disaster took out one of our five space-capable shuttles, and Columbia was lost on re-entry due to a damaged wing leading edge. Twenty-two flights later, the surviving shuttles that had flown to space, Endeavour, Atlantis, and Discovery, were retired. 
and can be seen today in Florida, California, and Virginia. Now we are seeing headlines claiming that the U.S. Space Force is going to take over Starship production and make it a completely military project. I think this is ridiculous. The Air Force didn't take over Lockheed to make the F-22 Raptor or Boeing to make the X-37B. They contract with these companies to own military versions of these vehicles. Do I want to see that happen? Absolutely. The rules regarding military flight are completely different from those regulating civilian flight. The Space Force decides to test a rocket it owns. The FAA can't just tell them no. It is a matter of national security, and this advantage could be critical to Starship's development. America's competition is moving quickly to secure its future in space, and the U.S. needs to do the same. By the way, I personally think that the plan to fly and land Starship for point-to-point -point transport of military supplies and equipment, shown here, is stupid. Why? Because this thing would be so easy to take out with a good 50 caliber rifle from two miles away while it's trying to land in a combat zone. What would be a lot smarter? The United States military has developed the reusable parachute cargo drop system, shown here being tested at the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. The system can safely land up to 10 tons of cargo. Starship should not fly with 100 tons of cargo and try to land in a combat zone. Starship should fly from one U.S. military base to another one, passing over the target area on its flight, and dropping 10 parachute-equipped GPS-guided combat cargo pods. Each of these would have a reaction control system to control its re-entry into the atmosphere. It would then fall to a low altitude, reaching terminal velocity. The RCS system would then fire, slowing it down enough for the parachutes to deploy, and firing one more time, just before impact just like the Soyuz and New Shepard space capsules do. The Starship would continue on its trajectory and land at a U.S.-controlled location, where it can be safely refueled and flown again. Would it be hard for us to find two bases with our target between them? Here is a map of known U.S. military bases and installations. Over 700 of them. Plotting a trajectory will not be hard. We could also launch from and land on pre-positioned carriers and barges or if necessary, do a complete once around the Earth. Ultimately, Space Force-controlled starships loaded with supplies and staged at Starbase could be fueled and launched over its target within a couple of hours of the order being given. Remember that Starship doesn't need Stage Zero to spin up. And less than 28 minutes later, supplies would be descending to the landing zone. I don't know how long it will be before Marines or space dropped on the enemy, but I can tell you right now that Heinlein will be smiling down from that great simulator in the sky. Something to think about. Thanks for watching, and stay safe at Astro Proterra. Hello, fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible, to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. To take this channel to the next level will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.